Good afternoon. <clears throat> uh, I, I'm pleased to be at this wonderful meeting. Thank you, Aubrey, for uh, the opportunity. And uh, uh, <clears throat> our group was uh, is puzzled with uh, something which I think everybody else is sharing in this audience, is with this paradox that during the last 100 years, many more people reach this magic point of 90 or 100 years uh, uh, right now, due to the efficacy of medicine, uh, massively people reach this point. However, if you look what is happening after that, the result is quite disappointing. There is a strong stop, which in uh, graphical form is shown as very nice winning of average longevity due to the uh, achievements of medicine. and complete lack of extension of maximum longevity, indicating that whatever we do with age-related diseases, we will never be able to extend the maximum lifespan, So, which means that aging is not equal, equivalent to age-related diseases, which we all know are very druggable and <clears throat> defeatable. And uh, the question is, what is the mechanism over there? Today, there have no drugs which would do that in, in mammals. So, um, obviously, when we think about the disease, these days we always think about the target. Uh, and when you look at aging of mammals, one thing which strikes you is that it suspiciously resembles poisoning. <clears throat> this picture is taken from the review about the role of alcoholism in accelerating aging. So these two people drank too much. And uh, <clears throat> clearly they... Uh, they have reversible, actually, change in uh, appearance, uh, which is interpreted by, our, uh, by us as accelerated aging. So uh, if, in, and the idea of poisoning is very popular, uh, it goes back 120 years when Ilya Mechnikov thought that poisoning is coming from microflora of the guts. The th thought was very good, but obviously not, uh, did not solve the problem. Today we have uh, another target, which is uh, very popular. Many people here will have two sessions about this target, and, uh, uh, which are senescent cells, which, uh, according to senescent cells' theory of aging, are accumulating with age and poison the organism with products of their secretion. And you know, this is a very appealing uh, theory because it gives you the opportunity to fantasize that if you have the drugs which would eliminate these poisoning cells, uh, the uh, rejuvenation will come. So, being inspired with these thoughts uh, and knowing that senescence is, uh, at least in vitro, is uh, resulting from DNA damage uh, and certain cells prefer to go into irreversible growth arrest, acquiring all the uh, other biomarkers of senescence, we decided to, uh, being impatient, to accelerate aging in a mammal uh, by simply enforcing DNA damage to its extreme. So the idea was that if you take the mouse and give it huge dose of radiation, which is absolutely lethal, but you can rescue it by uh, syngenetic bone marrow transplantation, and this TBI BMT mouse should be, <clears throat> if theory is right, the uh, model of accelerated aging, and one would expect that it would start aging very early and will become miserable very soon, and it will study it as a, a model of uh, senescence aging. So what is the result? The result appeared to be so interesting that we're already spending several years studying this result. So this is the typical uh, life and death curve for C57 black mice in American animal house under protection of ethical protocol. So um, this is, uh, by the way, when we measure uh, aging, we're measuring not only chronological aging, but we spend some time uh, investing into finding the objective measure of biological age, which is named physiological frailty index, which is a measurement of certain number of physical, physiological, and biochemical parameters and their deviation from the norm, which is young, healthy mouse, uh, uh, through uh, certain calculations gives you the value which grows with age. And these are calibration curves of increasing physiological frailty index in males and females 
of uh, mice which um, uh, you can find in published literature. And we're using this frailty index all the time as a measure of biological age of this particular organism. So, when we uh, apply total body radiation with bone marrow transplantation approximately at week 10 of age, we would expect that mice will soon start uh, dying. The reality appeared to be that they died earlier, but about only 20% less their duration of life was than controlled mice. This, was, this is good, this is a little disappointing, but still not bad. But what was really shocking is then we measured frailty index in these mice uh, in about a year following total body radiation with lethal dose of radiation, which would be lethal without bone marrow transplantation, because it appears that these mice have better frailty index. So we had to conclude after we measured that in mul multiple times that mice that were rescued from lethal total body radiation by marrow transplantation have shorter but happier life. So um, uh, then we wanted to see what's going on in these mice, uh, looking for uh, cells with biomarkers of senescence. And uh, making a very long story very short, I can tell you that we had to say no almost to any question we asked. We didn't find any indications in increased cytokine levels in these mice, which would be indicative of accelerated aging and inflammation, uh, chronic inflammation increase. We did not find any, uh, as I showed you, showed you, frail index elevation within at least one year of observation following radiation. We did not find any increase in SA beta gal positive cells in tissues. And moreover, when we used mice, a reporter mice, which under P16 promoter have luciferase, we failed to see any increase in, uh, in luminescent cells. Uh, while with age you do see this accumulation. So, you may ask, do these mice have DNA damage? The answer is yes, because if you take their lungs f 14 weeks, for example, in this particular following irradiation, lots of time, right? And then you uh, uh, do tunnel staining, and tunnel staining detects any DNA damage. It can detect even one, uh, one chromosomal break per cell. You see that about a quarter of cells Live, these mice live with about a quarter of cells which are uh, unrepairable, unrecognized DNA damage. And it's unrecognized because we tested, we did RNA sequencing. We do not see any traces of DNA damage response in these animals. Uh, so we had to come to the conclusion that majority of cells in these mice, uh, a lot of cells in these mice, stay with unrecognized DNA damage during the entire life of these mice. So but the problem is that they are only dormant for uh, some time because the moment you start plating them in culture, and regardless how long ago this mouse was irradiated, a week, a month, or a year ago, or two years ago, there is not a single mesenchymal cell from any tissue which in this mouse would be proliferating. 100% of mesenchymal cells in this mice go into senescence, activate DNA damage response, and induce senescent program, which when you reach the dose 11 grays, reaches the plateau. 100% of mesenchyme in these cells is incapable of division. And these mice at the same time have the same or better frailty index. So, uh, remember, we started all this work trying to find connection between DNA damage and aging. So far, it looks very disappointing. So what is interesting that all this phenomenon is true only for mesenchymal cells, maybe some other, but definitely not for epithelium. Uh, epithelial cells, there is something uh, glitch in computer. There should be some pictures here. Uh, but for example, if you plate in culture hepatocytes or just total cells of the liver, in intact mice, you see equal proliferation of cells with mesenchymal and epithelial markers, while in those which were irradiated several months ago, you see proliferation of only epithelial cells, while all mesenchymal cells go into senescence. The question is how this animal live? This animal that who does, not, who does not have a single mesenchymal cell capable of proliferation, and at the same looks like a mouse, runs like a mouse, and uh, frailty index, which is good. So, is there any way to reveal its deficiency in ability to divide? Yes, there is. After some thoughts, we came up with an idea which actually worked very well. How can you enforce proliferation of mesenchymal cells systemically? I'm not talking about 
uh, for example, wound healing. We did, definitely did wound healing, but these are local events. How to do it systemically? And there is a way, because if you uh, think how um, uh, gain of weight and adip uh, ad ad adipose tissue formation is ongoing when you put the animal into a high s supply of energy, it involves recruitment of lots of pre-adipocytes from mesenchymal stem cells, which involves cell divisions. So, which means that formation of fat is a pr procedure which actually le starts from division of mesenchymal precursors. So, we simply took these mice, as well as control mice, and we put them on a high-fat diet. We, first of all, we immediately noticed that while control mice, this is control mice on normal diet, these are control mice on high-fat diet, they become with time almost twice fatter, uh, heavier, while the mice which were, uh, with bone, underwent bone marrow transplantation, they barely gained some weight and then practically uh, stopped doing that. The reason is very simple. They don't have mesenchymal cells capable of divisions. They cannot feed with uh, adipocytes, the newly formed adipos adipocyte tissue. So, of course, before doing that, we asked ourselves how much the procedure of putting mice on high-fat diet would uh, change their behavior, their longevity. So this is, remember the picture, this is normal mice, mice which were, uh, underwent radiation. Uh, if you give them high-fat diet here, they live shorter life, uh, clearly, but not tremendously short, approximately the same as the radiated. But now, you radiate mice, you wait for a couple of weeks before they, so their, their blood is recovered, and then you put them on high-fat diet. And here comes, uh, finally, this the result. So these mice are dying within a very few months with massive decline and massive increase in frailty index, indicative that there is a way to reveal accumulated DNA damage, but this requires very special conditions, and these conditions are environmental to a certain degree. So this is, in my opinion, and in my, according to my knowledge, is the fastest ever accelerated aging model which can be caused in normal animals by, by external procedures uh, associated with DNA damage. So, combination of total body radiation with bone transplantation high-fat diet has synergistic detrimental effect on both life and health span, resulting in more severe uh, frailty and accelerated death. If our explanation is right, that these mice live with damaged cells, but these damaged cells do not bother when they are in vivo to activate and recognize DNA damage, they only do it when they are forced to divide, then this theory has a very interesting prediction. There are mice whose mes mesenchymal tissue is actually dividing. These are small mice, pups, children. So uh, if uh, uh, the prediction was that if we try to do the same procedure with the mice who are still uh, growing, whose mesenchyme is not fixed yet. What would happen? So this is the old mouse, the uh, adult mouse, and we saw this picture already several times. Now we take 30 days old C57 black pups and did the same procedure with them. We radiated them and then we put them on a, well, if you don't do bone marrow transplantation, they die within about less than two weeks. If you do bone marrow transplantation, they survive, but they die approximately with the same speed as mice who received total body radiation, uh, high fat diet following total body radiation in adults. So the theory prediction works. So now we were convinced that indeed DNA damage can be translated into accelerated aging if it is com combined with the enforced cell division. The question is where it's an essence cells. Still, there are tons of cells which DNA damage. I can't imagine that none of them would convert into senescence. Why we don't see them? So, and here we start doing the work which is published, so I will very quickly go through that. We labeled senescence cells in culture and put them into the mouse following their fate. So this is how uh, the, the proportion of quiescent cells is declining with days interperitoneally and subcutaneously. This is how senescent cells. Senescent cells disappear faster. This brought us to the idea that somebody is eating them or killing them. How to find this somebody? So we organized the safari hunt for this somebody in the following way. We put senescent cells as bait inside alginate beads. Where they stay alive, they smell, 
uh, they breathe, but they cannot go out, and the, those who want to kill them can go in. And we put this alginate beads inside in the belly of mice, and we looked for how long these senescent cells live, and it appears that nobody, they, they live very happily. Really, uh, it means that they're dying not because of bad environment, but because somebody eating them actively. So how to find this somebody? In the we did the following. We took these beads filled with senescent cells. We put them into P16 luciferase mice. It was luck that we used these mice. And in two weeks, we suddenly start seeing massive luminescence in, this, in the belly of these mice, which could not go from senescent cells because senescent cells were not labeled. So, and then after two weeks, we isolated back the same bees, and you see they completely change their appearance. They become big, hairy, and covered with a thick layer of cells, vast majority of which appear to be macrophages, which, which, care, which carry two traits of senescent cells. They are P16 positive and they're beta gal positive. At the same time, they are macrophages. They can be restored back to proliferation. They do not activate P53. This is P3 independent process, and which means that what we see and think in P16 mice as senescent cells, at least in part, are also macrophages, and we need to take this into account. We have a proof of that, because if we give these mice luciferase mice, which are very old, you see, and they start expressing P16 luciferase, if we give them agent which kills macrophages or all phagocyting cells, their, their glowing becomes much less pronounced, and their fat from blue becomes white if you stain it with beta gal. So meaning that whatever is blue in fat are no senescent cells or senescent cells capable of phagocytosis. Well, um, all this together brought us to the following scheme. Under normal conditions of life, mesenchymal cells from time to time undergo spontaneous DNA damage, which is not recognized, and stay unrecognized unless they have wound healing or some other events, which would then turn them into senescence. Senescent cells will start producing SASP. SASP is mostly means the signal, uh, eat me, find me, eat me, and immune system, and uh, these macrophages is part of that immune system. We know now a couple of other cells which are involved there. They are eating them. And it goes as long as immune system is fine, but then something happens, immune system gets exhausted, most likely, as any branch of immunity can be exhausted. And this is probably the, the, the text that determines the, uh, this uh, mysterious timer of life. What is happening if you do DNA damage? If you irradiate mice, you have tons of these dormant senescent cells, which are not recognizable. Still, you have a little bigger conversion into senescence, and immune system gets exhausted faster, but, in, but up to a certain period of time, these mice are fine. They simply exhaust immunity faster. And therefore, uh, at some point, they die 25% uh, time earlier. If you do high-fat diet, you, you imitate the same process, you have a little bit shorter living mice. But if you combine high-fat diet with this, massively these cells start turning into senescence and they exhaust immunity much faster, leading to that dramatic reduction of longevity. <clears throat> so, now, where is the timer? We already touched a little bit, se several, uh, several um, uh, points of this timer. One is uh, this immunity. Immune system, about which, as I said, we know a little bit, we know these macrophages, we also did and published this work, which I don't want to spend time on, demonstrating that we have a spe special branch of humoral innate immunity. We have antibodies uh, encoded in our genes, which can recognize senescent cells. And they're also probably part of the elimination. Uh, but what about the generator of, senes uh, of, of DNA damage? Well, when we speak about generator of DNA damage, we usually think about bad habits, bad and pleasant habits, and we are trying to spoil our life, avoiding them in order to live longer and happier. <clears throat> but we all know that it doesn't really work well, not only because it's very hard for us to do it, but also because if it would be the reason, then duration of life of those who are living a sinless life would be many, many times longer, which is not happening, which means that most likely damaged cell generator should be endogenous, intrinsic, genetically determined, because every mammalian species has its own longevity, and species-specific. Well, till recently, we didn't know what it is. 
But literally, uh, two months ago, first and then a month ago, and, uh, we, there are two papers coming, one of which from uh, a leading a group of John Sidivi from Maryland, and uh, the other one is uh, uh, lead, led by Vera Garbonova with, uh, uh, with um, collaboration with us and several other people, some of which are here. Uh, these two papers came out which actually point us at the source of intrinsic genetically encoded and species-specific source of DNA damage. And this is something which I introduced a new word, our retrobiome. I think half of our genome is uh, occupied by products of reverse transcription. Virus-like element form 50% of length of our DNA, and I think they deserve a special term. I introduced this term named retrobiome. So uh, from th uh, this retrobiome, uh, which uh, appeared in evolution as several big explosions which occupied numerous sites in the genome, the most important one is line one. Uh, it's a repeat, uh, which repeat in, in our genome about uh, 500,000 times and 150 of which in us are still alive and technically active. And what is important that this thing encodes reverse transcriptase. So this reverse transcriptase has a number of activities. It's endonuclease because it's also integrase. It's polymerase, it's RNAs H. And what it does, it makes copies of RNAs, creating cDNAs and drives them into the genome back. <clears throat> and it does it both in cytoplasm and in the nucleus. So when in the cells, these repeats are in very uh, big, um, uh, they are subject of epigenetic repression. Uh, there are at least 10 mechanisms of the epigenetic repression, uh, meaning how important it is for us, for our survival to have them. But when this derepression happens and the reverse transcriptase of line one appears in our cells, it induces DNA breaks causing point mutations because of its endonuclease activity. It induces insertions provoking gene amplifications and deletions and modulations of gene expression. So, which means that the cell which happens to activate line element, it starts it creating a flood of cDNA into the genome, creating genomic instability. This cell, uh, its progeny becomes genomically unstable and becomes the source of cancer. And at the same time, uh, these events are interpreted by the cell as activation of a viral invasion. They activate interferon response through the very well understood mechanism, thereby driving both aging and cancer. So, does it really have anything to do with reality? Yes. If you compare young and old blood from the same dog, for example, and the same done with mice. So these are two female dogs, blood from which was taken with six year interval, and uh, their genomes were sequenced and uh, analyzed. And it appears that within six years, all, so all, all kinds of uh, retro elements increase in numbers. So in somatic cells, the number of uh, retrobiome expands. So rarely it happens that they are waking up. So all this together bring us to the following scheme. Healthy life is a balance between constantly ongoing retrobiome generation of damaged DNA and damaged cells and constant clearance of these cells by a specific, most likely specific branch of immunity keeping us okay. Aging is a progressive DNA damage plus immunosenescence. With time when the immune system gets exhausted, the balance is towards uh, DNA damage and what is happening, what we imitated by uh, irradiation, but with much uh, slower time. Well, what can we do about this? How this picture tells us how we can counteract these processes. And actually, this is the most interesting and probably the most inspiring and promising uh, direction. So, this strong stop of life, as we understand it today, is the result of poisoning organism with unclean garbage of damaged cells, whoever they are. I'm not, I don't mean senescent, uh, modified macrophages, you name them, I don't care. So uh, they are normally being cleaned by immunity, but they are constantly influxed back through retrobiome activation. So one thing is to stop the process of influx. How to stop retrobiome? Remember that all the events happening in the retrobiome are driven by reverse transcriptase encoded by one specific element, line one. And reverse transcriptase was invented by nature only once, 
And all these reverse transcriptases, telomerase and reverse transcriptase of hepatitis B, HIV, and they all bifurcated, they all originated from one source, meaning that they have very similar active center. And some of the drugs which were developed to treat HIV nicely work, not, not perfectly, but nicely work against, um, against the uh, reverse transcriptase of line one. And another thing is to stimulate immunity. So we can, as practitioners, we would like to invest in two ways. Either stop uh, garbage uh, uh, accumulation or in invest into cleaning of garbage. So this is a picture from the paper I, uh, I cited, cited you. So um, uh, Gorbunova and uh, us and Gladyshev and others. So um, it shows that with age, line elements become derepressed. The RNA goes to cytoplasm, ribosome make reverse transcriptase. Reverse transcriptase make copies of cDNAs. cDNAs uh, uh, in the cytoplasm activate through C-gas sting pathway interferon. The cell gets inflamed. At the same time, the same reverse transcriptase makes holes in DNA, therefore enforcing further DNA damage. All this together leads to sterile chronic inflammation, if this is going uh, without clearance of immunity system, and potentially is a detail, the part of longevity timer. So then you put uh, a nucleoside inhibitor of HIV reverse transcriptase, lamivudine or stavudine, which in principle active against this thing. What is happening? What is happening, oops, it's a, I'm sorry, it's a wrong, uh, wrong order. I, uh, anyway, um, what is happening, I will show you here. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I need, to, need to explain on the previous slide. Uh, uh, what is happening here is that these mice uh, who are, ha we, 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 this the work was done on mice w in which repeats were unleashed by lack of one of the epigenetic mechanisms of their repression, certain six. And these mice start living twice longer than they are, still not great, from 30 days to 50 days, but almost twice longer. And they stop being inflamed. These mice are born with interferon. They cannot move because they are constantly in, uh, in, in inflammation. They stop being inflamed in a few days of consuming stavudine or lamivudine and start running around as normal. So all this together brought us to the idea that many year, million years ago when we acquired uh, these repeats, and these repeats came to our genome uh, as explosions leading and responsible massively to creation of the diversity of animals in the zoo. It happens at the time of dinosaur extinction. Um, when all this diversity was created suddenly and very quickly, and then evolution didn't do much in terms of inventions. And uh, the hypothesis I want to say is that together with this repeats, uh, these new families, we acquired the longevity of every species because timer of longevity is a balance between uh, the ability of the organism to uh, uh, specivate retrobiome and activity of that particular retrobiome which this particular species acquired. So, and which means that every organism has its personal generator of DNA damage and its immune system, which is, long, as long as it works, we uh, will live. So, how can we, uh, what can we, how we prove it? How can we do it? There is a fantastic model, species named dogs. Dogs is the species where this process of expansion of repeats is still ongoing. Because all the properties of dogs which make them so variable, this is the most variable species in mammals, is actually today every, every trait of the dog, short legs of dachshunds and corgi, flat nose of boxer and others, when people detect, determined what is the gene responsible for that, it's always rat elements sitting in certain uh, place of the genome. So dogs are so diverse because the process of their variability creation uh, is, uh, is ongoing and we're maintaining it by keep making new and new breeds. So to do and to test that, we established this not-for-profit organization named VICA. It's the name of my dog, Husky, portrait you see here, which is in, uh, in Cornell University. We have a facility where we keep 104 uh, retired sled dogs from all over the place in the United States, in sled dog facilities, which are being treated with inhibitors of reverse transcriptase and other ways 
which we are trying to invent in order to uh, test our idea. And finally, in the last minute, I will say, what are we doing in the other side of the balance? What are we doing with immunity? You may say we don't really know much about who is killing senescent cells or other garbage. Yes, we don't know enough. But it happened that we know uh, something very, uh, which appeared to be quite relevant and worth testing. Many years ago, you see it's paper from 2008, our group developed the reagent, which today is in the hands of the FDA for potential approval as a radiation countermeasure. It's a radiation antidote. It's a modified flagellin of salmonella, a single shot of which given to monkeys or mice uh, or rats uh, within 48 hours post-lethal radiation dramatically increases the chance of survival. There are tons of papers published about that. The drug is named entolimod. It's toll-like receptor 5 agonist with relatively well-studied mechanism of action. So we have the drug which can rescue from acute radiation syndrome. What is acute radiation syndrome? This is the disease associated with massive accumulation of cells with DNA damage. What is aging? It's a disease we don't know exactly what it is, but our hypothesis is that there is a big impact of accumulation of cells with DNA damage. So if we have entolimod, which so nicely can rescue uh, animals from acute radiation syndrome, after, already, after damage already was there, we decided to test what would it do if we put it into the uh, aged animals. And the result appeared to be quite interesting. By the way, this is how entolimod works. This is the Kaplan-Meier survival curves of monkeys, rhesus macaques, which received lethal dose of radiation in control, 75% of animals die who received placebo. All other curves stand for the animals which received a single shot of entolimod with different doses. You see that the warmer the color, the higher is the, uh, the, the curve. So from 25% survival, it increases chances three times to 75% survival given on the 25th hour post irradiation. So we also know about this drug that it can clean organism from uh, micrometastases which you say, it rings the bell again. We want to clean the organ from damaged cells, which means that it can, uh, can, can enforce mechanism which finds and cleans organs from micrometastatic cells. And uh, uh, there are plenty of papers about that. So if you have mice which die from metastatic diseases, colorectal cancer, single shot of entolimod given before you remove the, uh, or after you remove the primary tumor, leaves about a third, uh, third mice uh, alive, and these mice are already resistant to rechallenge with the same tumor. So it's immunotherapeutic drug. So there is another reason to think that it may work against gar garbage cells, because when you senesce cells in culture, uh, it actually activates uh, TLR5 dramatically in these in this mice, in these cells. And if you take old mice and compare them with young mice, and these are reporter mice, which you can see in FKPB activation, that they are much stronger responsive to entolimod with age. So all this together was inspiring. Now what the result is? Remember I showed you the pictures of calibration curves of frailty index increase with age. So this is uh, male and female and age Swiss mice who simply pass through chronological aging. We did three experiments, very similar. Every time in the, all of these experiments, we spent one week five, making five injections on uh, weekdays of entolimod into these mice, only once in life. So either here, for example, it's about 45 weeks of age, and then we keep measuring frailty index after that at different time points. And you see that frailty index stops growing. So these mice behaved as if they are uh, uh, no longer continue being old. You do the same experiment, now you do it on the 55 week, it's another group of mice, you're getting the same result. You're doing it on the 75 and you get the same result. So basically, one week of treatment is remembered forever, but only in males. So <laughs> Nir yesterday gave us a strong examples about uh, sex specificity of anti-aging Treatments, this is one more example to your, it's purely male 
uh, chauvinistic drug, if you wish, <clears throat> at least in mice. We very much hope that in humans it would be different, but it's a matter of testing. So, and by the way, it increases the lifespan of males, but not females. So this drug is in development. We have a next generation of that, which allows chronic systemic multiple time injections in humans uh, because we deimmunize that. And our clinical translation scenario includes running uh, two types of clinical trials. One is uh, over, uh, aimed at overcoming immunosenescence in elderly people using co-injection of our drug together with vaccine, flu vaccine, and looking for how much extra uh, immunization we get. And we know that people above 65 don't really get vaccinated. And the other way, we will, uh, we will go into the age-related disease, uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, for which we have a very strong uh, data supporting that. This is done in collaboration with uh, Jim Kirkland's group and this with Stavros Kalorantiosis in Duke. Well, I will finish here saying that uh, by learning what is happening with systemic DNA damage, we found lots of interesting things. We found that organisms can keep them silent without noticing them. We know how to wake them up and why it become dangerous, and we explained why women who underwent uh, successful treatment for cancer, for breast cancer, if they are cancer survivors already, but they start gaining weight by changing their habits, eating habits, they start uh, gaining, gaining frailty. Uh, and uh, um, we also learned that there are at least two ways how to go through that, and we hope that this uh, uh, picture, which symbolically is located in here in, Br in Berlin, uh, Lucas Kranach the Elder uh, drew it in 16th century, which is a famous fountain of youth. I think now we can give you the recipe what is in the water there. Inhibitors of reverse transcriptase of line one and simulators of innate immunity. Thank you.